Thank you so much, Dave. It's such a pleasure to be with you here today. And we are going to be taking questions the same way that we did before, um, which is using pollev.com. If it asks you to answer a name, just answer, enter mine, Catherine, with two A's. The link is in the chat there as well. And as I did yesterday, the first question I have for you is, where are you joining from? Go ahead and click on this map to show us where you're joining from around the world. And I see that a lot of people have already done this. All right, we have a lot from the US and Canada. We have a lot from Europe and Portugal, I see specifically. Uh, quite a few from Africa, Southeast Asia, Australia. Wow, it is really late at night for you, isn't it? All right, perfect. So this is what we're going to use to take questions to, and we'll get there in just a minute. But first of all, I want to start where we left off yesterday. So yesterday, when we ended up with questions, I got a question I'd never gotten before, sort of a meta question. And the question was, what is the most common question that you get? Well, interestingly, I know what that question is because I collect my questions and I analyze them. And it turns out the most common question that I've gotten over the last few years from any audience in any location is some version of this, what gives you hope? So before I get started, I wanna turn this around to you. And in one word, if you have to use two words, put a dot or a dash between them. You'll see why, because this is going to be a wordle. In one word, or if you need to, put a dot or a dash in between them, what gives you hope? All right. As you can see, this is why I wanted you to put a dot or a dash if you have more than one word. But I know that somebody did put young people in there, children. Jesus, God, Christ, the resurrection, reconciliation, redemption potential, success stories, yep, God's promises, kindness, the local church, community. Good, human resilience, examples, yep, science, I love that. Common grace, stories trees. So this is really interesting because you already know what I'm going to say. But I'm going to take these answers and break them down into three large categories. Categories which I prepared ahead of time, but which I see right here. Now, as we go along, you are able to put your questions here at any time. So you can write your question from now on in Poly V. You can upvote other people's questions because we won't necessarily have time to take all the questions at the end. So feel free to upvote the questions that you most want answered. And these questions will stay open for the rest of the presentation till the very end when Dave will come back on and we'll take some of these questions together. But let's start, first of all, talking about hope with where I don't find hope. I don't find hope in the science where it seems like every new study that comes out shows that climate is changing faster or to a greater extent than we thought, or the impacts are much broader or more expensive. I don't find hope in our scientific studies. It gets even worse. We see headlines like the European heat wave is five times likelier. Alaska had its most expensive wildfire season on record. Flooding, sea ice. As I talked about yesterday, and if you missed that talk, it was recorded, scientists can now put numbers on just how much worse climate change is making a given event. And although it's useful to have those numbers, it is not hopeful. I talked yesterday about how climate change is increasing the gap between the richest and poorest people in the world by as much as 25% since the 1960s. I mentioned how the United Nations has warned that climate change could undo the last 50 years of development, global health and poverty reduction. So often when people see these warnings, these dire threats, they turn in our world to politics for hope. But we know that there hasn't been a lot of hope in politics either. 
The last four years of the United States was just one headline after another of negativity and rolling back sensible regulations and inaction. Even today, people pinned a lot of hope on the new US president being reelected. And yes, he did rejoin the Paris Agreement. And yes, he did set targets for the United States. But globally, we're nowhere near the Paris targets. Currently, our pledges and targets will end us up at about two and a half degrees, and the Paris targets are between one and a half to two degrees. And a, a, a new a news article that one of my colleagues just sent me the other day was talking about how the White House is downplaying the risks and saying, well, you know, we just need some incremental changes and all will be well. It's not just what's happening in the United States. In the UK, a study a few years ago found that Tory members of parliament were five times as likely to vote against climate action. In Canada, when I analyzed all of our party's climate plans, which the good news is they all had climate plans, it turns out the conservative plan was actually to increase emissions. In Australia, the coal industry and the Murdoch media has an iron grip on climate action. And when we turn to social media, it looks even worse. I get um, messages like this on a daily basis. This is just a random sample, ones I specifically picked that are related to our faith. When you're a scientist and you're telling people climate is changing, humans are responsible, the impacts are serious, we need to act now, like a physician warning of the dangers of smoking or poor diet or poor lifestyle choices, and you get told that you're a fraud, that you should be arrested for doing so, that you are going against what the New Testament says, it's really hard to find hope in that. So I did, what I actually did today is I turned this question around and I said, what gives you hope? And I asked people that. And I wanted to be clear though too, what hope is not, because often hope I found out is a very charged word. There's a lot of people that when you say the word hope and when you say we need hope, they'll say, no, we don't need hope. We don't need hope. Hope is not what we need. We need courage or we need anger or we need action, but we don't need hope. It's interesting that that word hope invokes such a strong reaction. And what I've found is typically it's because they're reacting to a false sense of hope. What hope is not? Hope is not a Pollyanna type hope. I don't know if you remember the book Pollyanna, but I read it when I was little. And that was the idea where you just say, oh, well, if I just think of everything as being good, if I just imagine everything as being good, if I just focus on the good, if I just wish myself into hopeful thinking and positive thinking, everything will work out great. A lot of people still think when we say the word hope that that's what it is. People often view hope, too, as simply burying your head in the sand. If I don't think about it, if I don't look at it, if I don't hear anything about it, then I'll stay hopeful. But that's not real hope. That's false hope. That is not what hope is. Real hope, first of all, recognizes the true risk. You look it in the face and you realize just how bad it is. That's step number one. Real hope accepts that success is not inevitable or even guaranteed. But real hope also provides a, bit, a vision of a better outcome or a future, something that you're heading towards, not only something that you're running away from. And this is consistent with the vision of hope that we see in the Bible. In Romans, the Apostle Paul is talking about hope and he begins in a very unusual place. He doesn't begin with positive thinking. He doesn't begin with cushy circumstances. He doesn't begin with, you know, everything is right with the world. You know, just close your eyes, close your ears. You know, don't listen to anything. Just think positive thoughts and it'll all be all right. No. What's the first word here? The first noun. The first noun is suffering. He says, we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character is what ultimately produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, as other translations say, or put us to shame because of the love of God that's been poured out into our hearts. So hope is not closing our eyes to the realities of just how bad it is. Hope is not failing to acknowledge the suffering. It is acknowledging it fully recognizing just how bad it is, recognizing that the science is bad, the politics is bad, the discourse is bad. And that's the beginning of hope. 
So I turned this question around, like I mentioned, and I asked hundreds of people, what gives them hope? And I sorted their answers into categories. Very interesting. And you'll see a lot of these same categories in your answers before. I wanna focus on three of these categories. The first category is the biggest one. It's almost 40% of people's answers. It related to what other people are doing. So adult leaders and advocates, technology, innovation, movements, organizations, people collaborating and talking with each other, all of that falls into one big bucket of what people are doing. So let me give you some examples of this and then explain why this gives us hope. So people like to hear stories of innovators like uh, Ball State University that has the biggest geothermal system in the United States with over 36,000 uh, geothermal boreholes to power their campus. The fact that Scotland's got the first tidal energy testing facility or that there's technology to suck carbon out of the air and turn it into fuel. The fact that there's countries that are phasing out coal, that are divesting from fossil fuels. When I was asked two years ago, there was an article two years ago, or a year ago, I should say, saying, what gave you hope in 2019? And this came out a year ago, last January. And they asked me and I, I gave them a long list. It had nothing to do with the science or the politics. It had to do with what people and especially countries were doing. I talked about how we have a federal price on carbon in Canada that's being ratcheted up significantly year by year, about how the UK has a moratorium on fracking, Finland is phasing out coal, Norway's sovereign wealth fund is divesting from companies dedicated to exploring for oil and gas, New Zealand is committed to being carbon neutral, Scotland is actually, it's almost 100% green electricity. Talking about what corporations are doing, Microsoft, Apple, Walmart, and more. There's hope in looking at what investment funds are doing. And I actually love this quote from the president of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. It said, John D. Rockefeller, the founder of Standard Oil, moved America out of whale oil and into petroleum. And we are quite convinced that if he were alive today, as an astute businessman looking out to the future, he would be moving out of fossil fuels and investing in clean, renewable energy. That's a pretty hopeful statement, isn't it? In 2014, 2014, seven years ago, was when fossil fuels lost the race against renewable energy. That was the first time where the world added more clean energy that year than more new coal, oil, or gas sources of energy. And it's happening in unexpected places and ways in Texas, in India, in China. It's happening in, like I talked about yesterday, some of the poorest places in the world where they have millions of people living in energy poverty. They don't have access to massive resources of the coal, gas, and oil that the North America, Europe, and the Middle East has, but they have plenty of sun and plenty of wind. And because of that, their lives are being revolutionized by clean energy. Alaska has the most diverse sets of energy in the world. You probably didn't know that. They have, they have so many different types of energy. They had a whole atlas of it. They do have solar, they do have wind. They use all kinds of different sources. There's hope in faith-based organizations like Arasha of people getting together and saying, yes, we do want change and working together, it can happen. So what's the scientific word for what we're talking about here? The scientific word is efficacy. It was coined by a psychologist back in the 1970s who understood and explained how people are willing to change if they feel like what they do will make a difference. And study after study with climate change has shown that people often don't feel like they can make a difference. In the United States, more than 50% of people feel helpless when they think about climate change. Over 50% of people don't know where to start. This survey over here on the right-hand side surveys, um, I think they surveyed over 60 countries. Not all of them are shown here, but most of them. And I want you to focus on the pink dots here. The pink dot is, could I be doing more? There's some countries where people say, yes, I think I could be doing more. Spain, Italy, Thailand, Vietnam. Vietnam is actually at the top of this list. Taiwan, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Indonesia, India, and China. 
But there's a lot of countries where less than 50% of people think they could be doing more. Great Britain, France, Australia, Germany, Singapore, the United States, Philippines, and so on. Why is that? It's because we don't feel a sense of efficacy. We don't think that we can make a difference. And in a sense, we're actually right. I've calculated that if everyone in the United States who was alarmed or concerned about climate change did everything they could to cut their personal carbon footprint, that wouldn't even eliminate 10% of US emissions. Why? Because we are confronting a system-wide problem. 90 corporations are responsible for two thirds of heat trapping gas emissions since the dawn of the industrial era. And so often as individuals, we feel like we can't make a difference. And it's true, me changing my light bulbs is not gonna change climate change. But can I make a difference? I can. And how we make a difference is when we recognize that climate change, climate action, climate solutions solutions to really all the world's problems. It's not like a giant boulder sitting at the bottom of the hill with only my hands on it trying to push it uphill. There are millions of hands. I couldn't find a picture of millions of hands. So you have to picture millions of hands here. There are millions of hands pushing that boulder. And in fact, in many cases, in many ways, that boulder is already at the top of the hill and it's starting to roll downhill in the right direction. This is the sense of efficacy, the idea that it's already moving in the right direction. There's already many people on board with it. And what gives us that sense of efficacy? Sharing stories about what other people are doing. So when I was asked this year, as opposed to last year, I was asked this year for a new story that just came out three days ago, what makes you feel hopeful for World Environment Day, which was a few days ago. I said, I find hope in recognizing that I am not alone that the giant boulder of climate action isn't sitting at the bottom of a very steep hill with only a few hands on it. In reality, that boulder is already at the top of the hill. It's already rolling down the hill in the right direction. There are millions of hands on it alongside mine. With more hands, we can make it go faster. And the more of us there are pushing it, the greater the possibility of a better future for us all. That's what gives me hope. What was I communicating there? I was communicating efficacy. The idea that as individuals, we truly can make a difference. Finley put it a different way. I was, I've been reading a lot of books this summer um, in preparation for, right, or, or this past year in preparation for the book that I just finished writing myself, which is right here. And I read a really interesting book by a man called Duncan Green, who worked with Oxfam for many years, talking about how change happens. But what stuck out to me in this whole book was what his son said to him. And his son was sharing with his dad the moment when a light bulb went on for him. And this is the way he expressed it. He recognized that we have coped with massive boulders before. And slavery is one of those boulders. I know that Jean-Francois is on here, I saw your name. And he's written extensively about the connection, and maybe actually you could drop a link in the chat if you don't mind, about the correlation and the connections between how we viewed and talked about slavery and how we view and talk about climate change today. So here's what Finley said. He said to his dad, I finally got it. What climate change is for us is like what slavery was to people 200 years ago, a massive immovable object, that giant boulder, right? With only a few hands on it. Yet by being small cogs in a very large machine, people back then, they were able to make a difference. And he didn't say this, but we know that Christian and faith-based voices were a huge part of those cogs and those people making a difference. So while it's hard for us to see just how we can possibly make a dent, we have to remember it's been done before. What is he saying? He's saying that there's efficacy, that we truly can make a difference. Working together is how we do that. Now, how do we as Christians view this? Well, it's entirely consistent with the way that we think of ourselves too. The metaphor that the Bible uses for us as believers is not lone rangers. It is not individuals. The metaphor the Bible uses for us is a body. You are the body of Christ and every single one of you is part of that body. And it goes on, and I'm using the message here because I love, I love the way it puts it. It says, God's various ministries are carried out about everywhere, but they all originate from God's spirit. God's various expressions of power are in action everywhere, but God himself is behind it. Each person is given 
So you're given. It's not that you come up with it. Each person is given something to do that shows who God is. Everyone gets in on it and everyone benefits. Isn't this hopeful? We are not alone. We are not depending on our own self-effort. God is the spirit behind it. God is the motivation behind it. God has given us something that we can do. Each of us has something different to do. And each of us is contributing to the greater whole. We all have a chance to get in on it. And we all have a chance to benefit. This is efficacy. This is understanding that together, not only we can make a difference together, we can literally change the world. And in fact, if we look back in history, we already have. So that was the first category, working together and hearing about people who are doing things. The second biggest category, 23%, is young people, youth, and children. They give people hope. And I saw this popping up there in your answers as well. So I decided to dig into this a little bit more. What is it about young people or children that gives us hope? Well, when you start just looking at the headlines of what children are doing, it's very hopeful. 17-year-olds building an algae biofuel lab in their bedroom to win a science fair prize. 11-year-old girl developing a renewable energy strategy, schools using solar power. Young people suing federal governments in Germany and Canada and the United States for the right to a better future. The children's climate strikes children innovating and making a difference. Clearly, children are leading the way. So I decided to dig a little bit deeper and I asked people, well, is it the fact that you think children will fix it for us? And everybody said, no, 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 that's not it. It isn't that we're depending on children to fix it for us. It's that we find children, whether it's our own children, that's me with my baby many years ago, or, or children like Greta, we find children to embody to embody what? To embody the potential of future. There was a P.D. James novel that was written many years ago, but it's unexpectedly come back into popularity this year because it talks about a global flu pandemic that sweeps around the world. And as a consequence of that pandemic, people are not able to have children anymore. They don't realize it all at once, but they notice that birth rates are dropping off. They're just not, you know, maternity wards aren't filling up. And suddenly people realize that there are no more children. And because of that, that world becomes a completely hopeless place. As one character puts it in this novel, it was reasonable to struggle, to suffer, perhaps even to die for a more just and more compassionate society but not in a world with no future, where all too soon, the very words justice, compassion, society, struggle, and evil would be unheard echoes on an empty air. Why? Because there was no future as embodied by the next generation. So why do children, why do young people, why do our own children and grandchildren, why do hearing about the children's climate strikes, why does that give us hope? It gives us hope, as this World Vision Post said just four days ago, and I love that it was exactly on topic. It said, in a changing climate, children are the ambassadors of hope. They are the ambassadors of change. Why? Because they are the future. Remember I talked about how real hope offers a vision of the future. If there is no future, why do anything? Children embody that future. They are, we often talk about our children as a gift from God, and they are certainly gifts from God because they are the future. We continue through them, and that is why we're fighting. So as humans, our hope is based on the idea of a future, and for most of us, the next generation embodies that future. Even after we're long gone, it will continue. So how does this relate to what we believe? Well, hope is definitely tied to the idea of a future. And in Jeremiah, it says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. They are plans for good and not for evil. For what? To give you a future and a hope. In other words, future and hope are nearly synonymous here. And that's why we often look to young people, to children as a source of hope, because they embody our future. So lastly, 
you'll notice, and you probably picked up on this when I first showed this, that faith and God and spirituality are here. And it came in at number eight. But it's really interesting because I think that this is already woven through a lot of the other things that we've talked about. And this, this, these were mostly secular audiences that I was serving, by the way. If, if we ask Christian audiences, I think this would be quite different. But it still showed up. And how does that relate? Well, when I first started to connect the dots between what I studied and uh, my faith, I did what any good scientist would do. I went out to the bookstore and I bought all the books I could find. And back then, about 15 years ago, there weren't a lot of books. There was Cal DeWitt's Earthwise. There was Ed Brown's Our Father's World. And there was the Green Bible. So I bought these books and I think I bought maybe two or three other books. There wasn't a lot to choose from back then. And I read them. And in reading through the Green Bible, there were a lot of verses that specifically related, as I talked about yesterday, they specifically related to non-human creation. So I just got a list yesterday. Somebody asked me to contribute a devotional to, um, to a, a set of Bible readings. And they said, here, I'll send you a list of Bible verses and you can pick one of them. And they said they came from the Green Bible. So I started to look through and sure enough, just as in the Green Bible, it was related to animals. It was related to plants. It was related to livestock, animals, rains, land, trees. And that's all well and good. But I didn't see any verses that related to us as humans, to how we react to this issue, to what gives us hope, to how we respond. So I emailed them back last night. This was just happening yesterday after I gave my talk. And I said, I, I want to talk about the verse that's most meaningful to me in responding to these issues. And it's not on this list. For me, the most meaningful verse comes from 1 Timothy. And it begins with this. It says, God has not given us a spirit of fear. Why is this so important? And why is this so relevant? Because when we look at what's happening to our world, and when we look at the way what's happening to our world is messaged and communicated to us, often fear is the dominant message. One time I went to CNN's uh, homepage, just as an experiment when I was giving a talk on hope and fear, and I counted 35 headlines on its page. Of those 35 headlines, the majority were headlines that inspired fear, frustration, or anger. There were a few that were neutral, and there was not a single one that was hopeful. Why not? Because fear gets the clicks. They've done surveys of how everybody, the BBC, the CBC, the American news outlets, Australian outlets, how they predominantly communicate about climate change. And they've showed that overwhelmingly, the messages that are used in the media to communicate about climate change are fear-based. When you ask people, do you think global warming is happening? And this is just looking at the United States as an example. Most people say, yes, it is. But then when you say, do you ever talk about it? Most people say, no, absolutely not. Why? One of the biggest reasons is because we don't want to talk about something that scares the pants off us. We don't think it matters to us personally, but we don't think there's anything we can do to fix it. And I'm actually going to be talking about this specifically tomorrow. So I won't get too much into this today. This is the topic of tomorrow, but it relates directly to fear. We don't want to talk about something that just makes us feel like we want to pull the covers up over our heads and wish it would go away. So when climate changes, we often get caught in a vicious cycle. We get worried because how could we not get worried, right? And so what we do is we say, if everybody else isn't worried enough, they need more scary data. So we dump more scary data on people, and as a result, people reject it even more, and inaction results. Tally Sherrod is a neuroscientist. She wrote an excellent book, I think I have it here, called uh, The Influential Mind, What the Brain Reveals About Our Power to Change. And in it, she explained a number of things, including the fact that literally fear and anxiety causes us to withdraw, to freeze, to give up rather than taking action. And so climate just changes more. Let me say that again. Fear and anxiety give us enough adrenaline to outrun the bear, so to speak, right? They can give us a shot of adrenaline, but we don't need adrenaline to fix what's wrong with the world. We need to stay in for the long term. 
And ultimately what fear causes us to do is to freeze and to give up rather than taking action. So God is incredibly wise. He knows this. And so this is why he gives us a litmus test. He says, if you're experiencing fear, that is not from me. I am not giving you that fear. I have given you three incredible gifts and here's what they are. I have given you, first of all, a spirit of power. What? Now, power is kind of an old fashioned word. How do we use it today? We talk about being empowered. If you're empowered, you are capable of action. That's what power means. It means you are capable of action. It means you have efficacy. It means you don't have to be frozen. You don't have to give up. You don't have to be paralyzed. Having a spirit of power means you are able to act. What else has God given us? Love. What does love enable us to do? It enables us to think of others, not just ourselves, to consider others' needs, to have compassion on them, not just to act out of selfishness and fear, but to act out of care and concern for others. And as a scientist, I love the last one, God has given us a sound mind. So we are able to use the information that he has given us, including science, to make sound decisions that are good for us. This is what God has given us to confront all of the troubles and travails and challenges and problems and disasters in our world. Not a spirit of fear that will ultimately paralyze us, but a spirit of power to act, love to have compassion on and care for others, and a sound mind to make good decisions using information and facts. Isn't that hopeful? So what do we need to talk about? And again, I'm gonna talk about this more tomorrow. This is just a little intro. We need to talk about why and how climate change matters to who we are and all the positive things that we can do to fix it. I talked yesterday about how caring about climate change is who we already are because it affects all of us, especially the poorest and most marginalized, the very ones that we are told to love and to care for, to provide for. We also know too, though, that climate solutions help us all especially the poorest and most marginalized, clean energy for those living in energy poverty, regenerative agriculture for those who live on the edge of hunger, healthy economy for those who are impoverished, the opposite of resource scarcity, resource abundance for those who don't have enough. So when climate changes and we get worried, here's where we can break that cycle. Instead of sharing more scary data, we share why it matters how it affects us in ways that we care about today and what we can do to help fix it. People feel empowered and action results. In neuroscience terms, again, quoting Tally Sherratt, the human brain is built to associate forward action with a reward, not avoiding harm. So reframe your message so the information you provide induces hope, not dread. From the Bible to neuroscience, the answer is the same. Fear is not what is going to solve our problems. Rational hope that begins with the recognition of just how bad it is, not burying our heads in the sand, but then recognizing that there is the chance of a better future. And it is intimately tied to who we are. We do not bear the weight of the world on our individual shoulders. We are not trying to push that boulder up the hill all by ourselves. God has already made us what we are. We are a creation of God to do what? To live lives filled with good works. And often we put a period there. We're like, okay, we have to crank out the good works because that's who God has made us. No, keep on reading. It says that he has prepared for us to do. God has already prepared things for each one of us to do as part of the body. He has made us into the perfect person to do those. And he has told us that the metaphor for our lives is that of a grape growing on a vine. When you walk past a vineyard, and some of you are joining from France, so you may do that today, you don't walk past that vineyard and you don't hear, what's that noise? It's the noise of grapes trying the hard as they can to grow. They're straining and they're pushing and they're trying to turn themselves into something they're not. Of course not. That's ridiculous. Where are the grapes getting all the motivation they need to grow? They're getting it from the vine. Who's the vine? Jesus. Who's the branches? Us. 
we are already made into those grapes. We just need to grow in who God has already made us. Another way to put it, and I'm splicing together three verses here, is that the love of God has already been poured out in our hearts. We don't have to strain for it and beg for it. It's already being poured out into our hearts so that Christ could dwell in our hearts through faith and so that each of us, again, to use that agricultural metaphor, being rooted and grounded in love, each of us can give and to do just as we have purposed where? In our hearts. We can do what we have purposed in our heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, because God loves a cheerful giver. And I know this verse is often used to talk specifically about giving money, but frankly, our time is much more valuable, isn't it? Our effort, what we do with our lives. God loves us to give cheerfully because he's already given us the heart that wants to do that. So in conclusion, when we talk about hope, we, we believers, we Christians can start with the sure knowledge that God has already made us into the perfect person to love others. And remember I said yesterday, what is climate change other than a failure to love? What is poverty and hunger other than a failure to love? God has already made us the perfect person to love others, to care for their needs, to act together in community with a sense of efficacy belonging to that body that gives us hope. And we are the perfect people to be inspired by the hope that begins with suffering, that leads to perseverance, that develops character, that turns into hope, that will never be disappointed because ultimately that hope is not in ourselves. It is not in other humans. That hope is the hope of a better future that comes from the only person who can give that to us, which is God. So again, that's why when I talk about climate change, I talk about loving our global neighbor. Thank you. <laughs>